Church, would you pray with me? Lord, we gather every single week to sing songs just like that, to remind ourselves of your faithfulness, to remind ourselves not to trust in um, uh, feelings or, or uh, um, the way things seem to be going, the, the trials and the various circumstances that enter into our lives, Lord, if we, were, if, if we didn't have um, a firm foundation in you, we might be prone to think that, that maybe you had turned your back on us, that maybe you had gone silent, and that, and that all of these things were going wrong because something had gone wrong. But in actuality, God, we return to your character. We, re- we return to the fact that you yourself are faithful. That's who you are, and, and you don't change. You do stay the same. You're the God of, of covenants, the God who, who made covenants with men, and though men broke those covenants, you never did. Lord, you are unfailing. You are unchanging. You are immutable. You are always the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, and we stake our hope in that alone. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to return to these notions, to remind ourselves, because we do indeed need reminders, Lord. We, if, if left alone, if not in your word, if not being reminded by the saints, if not praising your name uh, through song, if not praying to you, God, we don't, we don't stay the same. We get worse. We still have our flesh at work in us, we who are your children, and so we need this time. And God, we pray that you would get all the glory in this time, that it would be all about you. I, I don't need my ego puffed up, Lord. We need, we need the name of Jesus to be proclaimed today. And so I pray that exactly that would occur. I pray that that word, this word preached from this gospel of Matthew, this, this glorious, this beautiful book, would affect every single person in here. Whether a, an unbeliever who, who does not know you yet, that this would cause them to see things differently, that you would open their eyes through this message preached, and that they would turn from their sin and put their faith in Jesus for the first time today. And for the person that already knows you, let us know you in deeper ways. Let us be challenged to live out our faith uh, in more, in more uh, intentional ways that the watching world might see something different and be attracted to you as a result. But God, we rely on you to do the work. I I am powerless, God. I'm dependent upon you in this moment. So would you do the work? Would your word go to people's hearts by your spirit? And would they be changed as a result? We pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, I would encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word. We are in the gospel of Matthew, as I mentioned there in that prayer. And we are in chapter 8. And uh, while we went through a huge chunk last week, this week, we're just going to get down to a few verses. We're going to pick it up in verse 18, and we're going to read all the way down to verse 22. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I felt a little half-hearted. Good morning, church. Good morning. morning. Yeah, I mean, are we not in the church? Are we not here with God's people? That's something to rejoice over. Anyway, I'm sorry. I don't mean to make you feel bad. That's not my intention. I just want to, I want you to be as excited as I am. Uh, welcome to Shepherd's Church. If I don't know you, I would love to get to know you. My name is Max Monahan. I am the lead pastor here, and I consider that a great honor and privilege. I love this place, if you can't tell already. If my enthusiasm has not uh, come across, uh, I love this place. It's the best. Uh, I don't mean the actual best. There are other great churches out there. Okay, we're not, I'm going to move on. Uh, But I wanted to start by talking about uh, a a topic that I think I've addressed in the past before, and that's that's how we can't actually be prepared for certain things in life. Like, no matter how much people try to tell us this is what it's going to be like, you can't possibly know until you walk through 
that door. I think of uh, premarital counseling. You're walking alongside a, a couple, a married couple to be in their engagement season, and you're like, listen, it's going to be hard, okay? And you try and tell them, but they're just like, you know, our love is going to get us through. Um, and, and I think of parenthood. I mean, how many people told me parenthood was, it's going to be hard, and you know that, but you never really know that until you're running on no sleep, and anyway, you just can't know what it's going to be like until you're there. Um, I think of parents of older children. You try to prepare your kids for the real world as best you can, and then they get out there, and they they experience it, right? Try as you might. If you're the teacher in that scenario, the person trying to pass that information along, you are all but absolutely powerless to actually make that occur. I was given the reason for this back when we got the nod to plant the church, and some of you already know this story, but I was told these words, if I told you what you could expect in planting a church, you wouldn't do it. (laughs) So I'm not going to tell you, which is both encouraging and not encouraging at the same time. But I got that then. It made sense. But what I'm seeing now is a a new and profound angle on this concept. See, rather than having the perspective of you wouldn't do it if you knew what it was going to be like, I'm seeing it from this angle of God actually intentionally leaves room for this naive exuberance, right? He allows you to pass through that threshold with joy through a blissful ignorance or a a short-sighted ambition, whatever you want to call it. But in some ways, this is a good and godly thing. He allows you to to walk through that door excited, whether it's marriage, parenthood, or whatever, and that's just how he designed it. He conceals the difficulty of a thing in order for us to cross that threshold with joy. And all all the while, he's actually preparing you for the difficulties that are going to come. Ignorance ends up replaced by information, ambition replaced with understanding, and hopefully, Uh, that youthful fire doesn't get snuffed out in the process, right? But things go just a little bit differently with discipleship, with being a Christian. True, experientially, there is that that wide-eyed innocence where, um, you know, you become a Christian and and you think the odds are in your favor and so you evangelize to everybody and you just think they're all going to say yes and you're like, wait, why aren't they, right? And so every trial we're going to go through, it doesn't come at us all at once and so he leaves room for that early stage zeal and who doesn't love that, for the record, right? Like a new believer, like, give me, if you could bottle that up and drink it, I would. So awesome. But if we would heed the words of Jesus, if we just spent a little bit of time in God's word, he holds nothing back. We'll see in just a few weeks' time when he sends out his disciples, he, he pulls no punches. And we get to see hints of that today. And what we have here are two examples in our text today of that wide-eyed exuberance, at least it appears that way. Two guys that want to follow Jesus, but again, he's going to communicate in no uncertain terms, hey, I'm not, I'm not so sure you know what you're getting yourself into, but let me tell you. So that's what we're going to be getting into today. And just to preface before we throw the title up there, we have a title and a, and a subtitle, okay? We're kind of going through a series here, a five-week series, um, and so, you know, if, you, if you're like, man, I don't want to write all that much, you could just do the high price there, okay? That's, that's our title for this morning. But we are in the middle of a mini-series, and so I want us to see that that these five weeks are all, they all kind of fit together. We started it last week, and there was another part one, and this week we get a second part one, and and I'll explain that in a moment. So we're in the middle of a section on Jesus' authority, and we know that Matthew wrote this book to show that Jesus is the king who came to save the world. And he's reasoning with his Jewish Christian brothers from their Hebrew Bibles, what, what we would call the Old Testament, in order to do just that. And so let, let's throw up a, the outline of our section here. This, this seems like a lot, but this is our five weeks. Jesus performs three miracles. We saw that last week to show his authority over um, all of creation. And then this week we're in kind of an interlude period. So Jesus demonstrates his authority and then he takes a break and he answers questions about discipleship. And then there's three more miracles and then he's going to take another break and answer more questions about discipleship. And the whole point of this this formula is to say that this guy who has authority over all of it, this is what it looks like to follow in his footsteps. He's king over all of this. That's why he can perform these miracles. He is God. He has authority over his creation. And then these interactions, they point to the fact that this is what following that king with that authority in his kingdom looks like. 
Yeah, he has authority. But does that mean that we're going to have an easy life? We'll see today, not exactly. And why? Well, it's because his kingdom, while it has begun to roll out, the king is on the scene, therefore the kingdom has begun, right? It's not fully rolled out yet. You would agree, probably, if you talk to your next door neighbor who's not a believer, that they, they don't necessarily think that Jesus is king, right? But one day they'll know for sure, and that'll be our consummated kingdom. So in between these miracles, Jesus paints a picture of what life for his followers will look like in the now, but not yet, of his kingdom under his authority. And in order to guide our time this morning, we're going to ask a question. Okay, normally we do a big idea. This is our big question for the morning. What does it mean to truly follow Jesus? What does it mean to truly follow Jesus? It's a loud bird. God's creation, right? So we're going to answer this question in three ways, three aspects of following Jesus that are absolutely essential. They're rites of passage. It's what it's going to look like in one form or another. So that if somebody were to come up to you and ask you, hey, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? You could point to this list and say, hey, here's three things right here. This is what it means to follow Jesus. And I just think it's worth mentioning, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, there will be many who think they're on Team Jesus, right? But who on the last day will be rejected because in actuality, they never actually gave over the reins of their life to him. They wanted to remain on the proverbial throne. They thought they could earn their own salvation because they were good enough or what have you. And so I made a distinction here, and that's that word, truly. What does it mean to truly follow Jesus. Not, not what you say you're doing, but what you're actually doing, and that's important. We're not talking about, as we'll see today, following him when you feel like it's convenient. Excuse me, when you feel like it, or it's convenient. We're talking about truly following him, not just when there are, aren't better things to do. Letting him take the lead, leaving the world behind for him, and lifting him highest above all other priorities. And along those lines, here's our first answer to that question. It means letting him be head. It means letting him be head. You are not the captain of your life if you are following Jesus in its truest sense. He is your head, your authority, your leader, your captain, your commander, whatever you want to insert there. Now when I say this, what I mean is he sits in the driver's seat. You recognize this isn't a movie about you. You're on the poster. And he gets a a line in the credits, best supporting role goes to Jesus. I know that's how we often treat it. No, you're getting a role in his movie. Although it plays out in your life, it takes place in your life. Let's read our first verse and I'll show you what I mean. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. Now you might be reading that and thinking, wow, that's a lot to take from that one verse, but we'll get there. So just to set the stage here, Jesus wants to depart from where they are. Somewhere near Capernaum, presumably to the other side, the other side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee, due to the crowds that are uh, kind of swarming him. He issues this order to get into a boat and cross over, although that doesn't necessarily come through in our text here. We'll see that's the meaning of it uh, next week. And he issues this to a group of his disciples. (coughs) Um, It's obvious, based on the fact that a boat can't hold a crowd, (laughs) that he's not talking to everybody. So he's talking specifically to a group within the larger group of the crowds. And this is not to say that they are the 12 disciples so much as the people that are actually following him. The men in the two accounts that we see in our next two sections, they wanted to go with him, right? They, they made that clear by what they said. And just so we know where we're headed, we got a map for you. Woo! Yeah, maps. We love maps. So Capernaum, kind of top left up there, uh, the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. And where many scholars believe they're headed is to uh, Gergesa. I should have looked up how to pronounce that before. But you know what? Everyone's going to pronounce it differently anyways. That's where most people believe that they're headed, which is the land of the Decapolis, which is a a conglomerate of Greek city-states. It's not a Jewish region. One commentator put it like this. Its non-Jewish culture is indicated by the large herd of pigs being pastured in the area. We'll see that in verse 30 of next week. Jesus is thus, at this point, 
deliberately withdrawing from his Jewish environment. It is a foreign country on which it could not be expected that his Jewish supporters outside this disciple group, the true disciples, would wish or be able to go away with him, end quote. And so with that in mind, you may be able to tell the direction this is headed al- already, but if not, let me break it down for you. Jesus' call here is already alienating. It is already polarizing. Just the simple notion that they will be getting in that boat and leaving behind whatever life they have, whatever plans they've made for the week or whatever, that would be enough. And tell me, you guys know that one person that's like, um, hey, what are you doing tonight? It's like, buddy, I have had the last three weeks planned out. You're going to hit me up today and ask with, anyway, love that person, love spontaneity, okay? But for a person like me who plans everything out, I'm sitting here thinking, you want me to go right now? Drop my life? But not only is this an impromptu, spontaneous trip, but they would be entering into uncomfortable surroundings. Think of the fish out of water. If you were a Jew in that day, you were distinctly different from the Hellenistic people around you. You would feel like a fish out of water. I think of uh, the Wizard of Oz. We're not in Kansas anymore. Like, this is not our home. And so this short verse, it really sets the tone for our text today. These guys who are going to approach Jesus, their willingness to volunteer for this trip, they may be missing some things. Either they don't know the full scope of what he's asking, or they're not really as as exuberant as they first seem. But either way, that's the plan. Jesus gives the order and they make preparations to travel across the Sea of Galilee to a largely Gentile, which is to say not Jewish, land. And this is inevitably going to mean many people will not want to go. Now, this verse, in my honest opinion, this is a setup verse, okay? This is to set up the next four verses. Matthew is writing to let us know the situation. The crowd is growing, no doubt because of these miracles that he's performing. That would make him very popular. And as a result, he's giving orders to go to the other side. Get the boat ready for launch. There's no imperative here, which is to say that there's no command in this verse for us. However, it's on the basis of this one verse that Jesus will say in our text for next week, O you of little faith. It actually comes out clearer in Mark's version of the text, but the gist of it is this. If Jesus calls you to go to the other side, you shouldn't be freaking out when it seems like you're not going to make it. He called us to go to the other side. He said, we're going to the other side. We're going to make it to the other side. And so while it's not intended to be taken as a rule for godliness per se, I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to reflect on something we talked about a few weeks ago which is the call of Jesus, the proverbial call to the other side. There is a holy God. He is perfect in every way, to the degree that we don't really have a reference for him outside of his son who came to earth and his life and his word, the written word of God. Like, we don't even have a concept for it. When I pray about the holiness of God, I say, God, help me to understand it, because we've never met a human who's fully holy, except for Jesus. And this God who is so perfect, he made creation and it was good. Man, uh, the world, the heavens, the earth, and every creature that dwells in, it was a good picture. He said it was exceedingly good. And man had a special relationship with God because he was made in God's image. Which is to say there's an amount of God himself that he he, um, instilled in man. Like we look like God to some degree, even as fallen humans. Obviously not his character because he's not fallen. And, and where this was a great picture, we're intended to dwell with God forever. We're in t- uh, uh, intended to live a life that's glorifying to him. He said, uh, multiply and, and fill the earth, subdue the earth. He wanted to see his creation made in his image spread out across the globe to show this is what God looks like all over his creation. And this was a wonderful, wonderful picture. But what man did instead was disobey the one thing God told him not to do. And as a result, bringing sin into the picture, sin and holiness, if you haven't guessed it, they just do not mix. They do not go well with one another. And so there's a fractured relationship now between God and his creation that was once good and now is fallen, is cursed. And that's where we've been down to this very day. We have a a fractured relationship with God. We are sinners in our very nature. 
Anybody who has a kid knows that. You don't have to teach your kid to sin. You don't have to teach them to lie, to throw a fit when they didn't get the thing that they wanted. They were born that way. And where that relationship was fractured and we had no way to get back, God himself entered in. He sent this Jesus down to earth, the second person of the Holy Trinity. God himself came down to earth to do it all right for us, to fix the picture for us. He lived a perfect life, which is to say that he earned the, the favor of God, the righteousness of, that God required according to his moral law. He uh, died a substitutionary death as a perfect sacrifice because of that righteous life that he lived. And he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And all of that so that we who, who trust in him, who turn from our sin, which is to say that we repent, we say, I don't want to live that way anymore. We put our faith in Jesus and his finished work on the cross, his resurrection, and even his ascension and the fact that he is ruling and reigning right now as we speak. We, we are also resurrected bodily in the life to come, but spiritually in the here and now. People go from death to life when they put their faith in Jesus. That's what we call conversion. And all of this is by repentance and faith. And that's, that's the life in the, the now but not yet kingdom. right? As we wait for uh, the end of all things and for God to make this, this picture perfect and right, we have to figure out how to navigate and hence this discipleship part. But at the end of the day, not everyone is going to get into that boat. As we just talked about, it would have meant going to a foreign region and leaving your life behind at least temporarily postponing your plans and so we remember what was said in our last chapter enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few most people it would seem are not going to want to do this but for those of us that do this is this is a surrender it's saying you know what i don't, I don't want to be the captain of my vessel anymore I don't want to be the navigator. I've tried that. I made a mess of things. I wind up at destinations I didn't intend to wind up at. And even if they're the ones that I, I meant to get to, they end up making me feel empty. But the Son of God, not only is he the most trustworthy one to steer this ship, he doesn't make a mess of anything. In fact, he puts the pieces back together. He puts it all back together again. And when his ship seems like it's headed for disaster, even when it appears like the commander is asleep in the boat, as we'll see next week, it ends up being for your good. That's what a life with him at the helm looks like. And if you haven't done that today, let me plead with you. You are dead in your sins. And I say that because I love you. But there's somebody who wants to deliver you from that. And that's Jesus Christ. Have you let him be head, be leader, be Lord over your life? So that's, as I mentioned, not the, the call of the text per se, but when that's the call of your life, when Jesus says we're going to the other side, it's not that it's a good idea to get in, it's that it's the best thing that you could do for your life. In fact, it is the very definition of life. What does it mean to follow Jesus? It means letting him be head. It means allowing him to be at the helm, but also this. It means leaving home for him. It means leaving home for him. We read these words. And a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So a scribe approaches him. Um, if you haven't been here with us, uh, as we've talked about the scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes were um, your scholars of that day. Um, they were uh, often seen alongside the Pharisees as those who knew everything and yet still didn't recognize the Messiah that their scriptures pointed to. Um, when, when it says one scribe, <clears throat> it's not to say that this one scribe did want to follow Jesus outside of the many, right? Like we have at least one faithful scribe. I actually don't think that's the picture that we're getting here. This one scribe goes along with another of the disciples, so one guy comes up to him, another comes up to him. Okay, so that's what that one scribe means. These guys were keepers of the law. They should have known it all. They wrote the ancient documents. They were scholars. And of course, yes, they were listed alongside Pharisees as those who completely missed the point. Even this scribe who seems to be on board uh, is not fully. Okay, I'm just going to spoil it right now. He addresses him as teacher, 
which in the book of Matthew is only ever used by people outside of Jesus' inner circle. In fact, there's only one exception from among the 12 disciples who calls him anything close to that. He uses the word rabbi, which is the Hebrew word for teacher, and his name was Judas. So this guy is not, not as sincere as our text might make it seem. Jesus, he responds somewhat curtly, as far as we can tell, somewhat cryptically. You're like, what does that mean, Jesus? These creatures have dwelling places I do not. And this is, of course, speaking into the nature of following after Jesus. If you want to follow after him, this is what it means, what it looks like. He uses the term son of man, which is an important distinction that Jesus uses for himself. And this is a messianic distinction, which is to say it, it's a, a term for the Messiah. Okay, If we were to go back to Daniel 7, uh, it, it says one in the form of a son of man appeared over the waters, hovering over the waters. And that's Two images, really, in one. He's a human, okay? He, he looks like a human, uh, but also he is glorious. But what we're keying in on here is the humanity that's, I think, in view. That's what this text is trying to draw to our mind. Jesus' life on earth is not glorious. It's humble. It's uh, plebeian. It's contemptible. It's measly. And consequently, those who would follow after, hi after him, they're going to experience much of the same. There's also a play on words there, uh, which I just think is kind of cool. Son of man, uh, like a human, right? You're a son of a man, you're a human, which is to say mankind. And this is an irony because even the creatures of the earth have places to dwell and get comfortable, but the one who is created in God's image does not. But what's happening here? What's actually happening? Is our Savior just being unkind? Is he trying to be rude? Well, as you can imagine, he is not. Our text interprets what the scribe said as, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And that makes it sound like he's earnest. He's desperate to join with Jesus. I'll go wherever you go, Jesus. And perhaps there's some amount of that here. He's certainly expressing some kind of enthusiasm, but it's more likely based on the context that he's saying, I'll follow you to wherever you're going. Like on this trip. Like, yeah, I'll go down to the store with you. I'll follow you on this particular trip journey, which again is some enthusiasm, and we should find it commendable to some degree, but it just isn't quite the same as no matter where you go, I will be there for the rest of my life, for death or for life. And that is exactly how Jesus answers it. When he talks about animals having a permanent dwelling place, that's the literal definition of the word that we get for nests. He's talking about how they can roam, they can go on hunts, they can even be gone for days at a time. But when they're done with their roaming period, they have a home to go back to. But that is not the case for me, our Messiah says, or for anybody who would follow after me. I will roam, and I will roam, and I will roam. But as long as I am on this earth, that will be my lot. We should be asking why. I mean, is he just talking about a literal home? Because if we were to fast forward to the first verse of the very next chapter, it says that he's going to his own city. So if he has, in fact, at least a hometown, uh, there's reason to believe he also has a house, a home, at least within his family. So why does he say he has nowhere to lay his head? Well, it means that as long as he is here, that is, on earth, performing his earthly ministry, as well as, by extension, anybody else who would follow after him, it means he is away from his true home. even if he is in his hometown of Capernaum, even if he is in his own house, assuming he has one. Or, by extension, even if we are in our hometowns, in our own homes, even our homes, perhaps in our names, and paid off. In such instances, Christian, that's your home in a way, sure, but in actuality, that's not your home. This concept was something that the early church picked up on speedily. One author described it this way. As citizens of the kingdom, they viewed themselves as resident aliens. The Greek word there is paroikos, the word for sojourner or stranger, or a quote-unquote third race in the Roman Empire. Although residents of their cultural communities, their primary identity was found as inhabitants of God's kingdom, and thus they found themselves at odds with the way of life of their contemporaries. They got it. Yeah, we live here, 
but we don't really belong here. One of my professors described it this way, at home, everywhere, fully home, nowhere. What a concept. We cultivate a community. Hopefully you feel welcome here. We're building a community here. We gather stuff, we fill a house, and yet we're not really home. Nevertheless, to go back to that quote, we're also home everywhere. We're at peace wherever we go. And why? Because our Lord goes with us. He is with us to the end of the age. He'll say at the end of this book, every believer who is found in Christ is also found housing the Holy Spirit. So you never go alone. The spirit of truth, he goes with you. And if your citizenship is in heaven, see Philippians 3, 20 through 21, while we wait for him to return, while we await the return of our head and our entrance into our forever home, we've got the closest thing to that home going with us everywhere we go. And that's the picture that we'll get from Jesus. In just a few verses, he's going he's gonna to fall asleep in the boat in the middle of a storm. <laughs> he who promises he has not a place to lay his head, he will indeed lay his head. And not just that, but fall fast asleep in the midst of a raging storm. That's what at home everywhere looks like. God could bring you any kind of circumstance, yet if you have peace with him, if he is your home, you could be in the midst of the most horrible trial and still find peace. You are at home there because he is your home. Your home goes with you. And whether it looks like living for him here on earth or living with him there where he is, you're good. But that's a pretty nebulous concept. What does it look like specifically to leave your earthly home behind? Does it mean that you have to drop everything that you're doing, go on a missions trip? Should you only ever spend time in the church or only fellowship with Christians? Not exactly. I'm going to propose that leaving the world behind is a state of mind, a lifestyle, a way of life, a framework that our entire lives need to adopt, a lens through which we see all of this. I see it play out in five ways, okay, five quick ways for you, and I'm sure there's more, but these are just some quick ones, and uh, I'm just going to say this ahead of time, uh, I, I've got a, a real kitschy name for it, go for it. Uh, these are the realities of leaving La Casa lifestyle. I know that's horrible Spanglish, and I think that just means leaving the house. Uh, yeah, I don't have much more to say about that. I'm sorry, I guess. But here are five realities for leaving your home behind for Jesus. Number one, you are under the world's delegated authority. Okay, this is a reality that we can't shake. We live in a tension between Romans 13 and Acts 5. And what I mean by that is Romans 13 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God, which is to say, just because you're leaving the world behind doesn't mean the world has no bearing on what you do or how you live, etc. You still have a boss. There's still a government. There are still members of law enforcement agencies, and we honor their authority as being given to them by God. Even as we call to mind Acts 5, wherein Peter and the apostles responded after being commanded by governing bodies not to preach the gospel, said, we must obey God rather than man. So we are under delegated authority, authority that God has given to governing powers in this world. And as long as it doesn't infringe upon what God commands us to do, that is just a reality. And we need to accept it, even as our citizenship is elsewhere. Number two, you are untethered to the world. Untethered to the world. We hold everything loosely. We recognize that everything that we have has been given by God, and he could take it away at any moment. Like Job, right? God allowed Satan to strip Job's life and even afflict Job physically, and yet he still refused to, uh, in the words of his wife, curse God and die. Um, I, there's a dear brother in the Lord, he, put, he puts it this way, you know, I was like, oh, you know, do you want me to grab a coaster? You know, he said, uh, it's all going to burn one day. <laughs> like, I'm not taking this with me. It's probably not going to make it into the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, there's some debate about that. But it's just stuff. People will be shocked. Tell them, I don't live here. <laughs> this changes the way you buy things, the way you live 
C.T. Studd, the great 19th century, century missionary, he once said it like this. You may know this one. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. This life and the things in it, these things which are not tied to eternity, they are but a vapor and they will fade. And so we labor for the eternal things. We're not tied to the things that are not eternal. I always think of 1 Timothy 4, 8, which is a little out of context, but Paul says this to Timothy, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Do we see things that way? Like what bearing does this have on, it, on eternity? If none, uh, what am I doing fretting over it? Number three, unfazed by the world. A life of leaving the world behind looks like being unfazed by the world. And I don't have a whole lot of elaboration here. I just have a few passages. Isaiah 8, 12 through 13. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy and do not fear what they fear nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Hebrews 13, 6. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my help, helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? If you are in Christ, what is there to fear? Why fret over this world? Why, why be fearful in this world? Unless you're fear, fearful of your standing before God, in which case, you know, that's something to consider. But like water off of a duck's back, you're not holding too tightly to circumstances. You're trusting his will. You're not fearful of what people will do or say or think. You're living with a holy fear of God. Number four, unstained by the world. James 1.27 gives this picture of pure religion, right? He says it's, it's uh, taking care of widows and orphans. And, and another characteristic of it is to keep oneself unstained from the world. As you walk through the world, your life in this world should be like, um, like Teflon, like a Teflon life. Even if all around you be sin and filth, you come out squeaky clean. You're not going to forfeit your allegiance to your eternal home to appear as a citizen of the place that you don't belong. That's not to say that you can't adopt, you know, their clothes or tailor your speech to reach that audience, but you never adopt their sin. You remain unstained. And so I, I got to ask, in your dealings with unbelievers, who's rubbing off on who? Who's influencing who? Don't put yourself in a position to sin, but where you inevitably encounter it, are you emulating it? Jumping right in with the crass, um, you know, water cooler language? Or are you distinct from it? And in so doing, do you recognize once again that this place is not your home and nevertheless, while you stay unstained from the world, unfazed by the world, all the uns, number five, you are also unusually for the world's good. Even as the unbelieving world is opposed to the message of Christ, even if it repels you by proxy, you want what is best for the world. Because that's what an eternal mindset, a, citizen, a citizenship in heaven looks like. It doesn't look like kicking back. It doesn't look like watching a wicked world plummet to their doom while you coast into God's presence. Like, I, I punched my ticket, let them worry about themselves, because you yourself had the same ticket that they had, the same one-way ticket to destruction. And that should humble us, because every Christian here today needed and still needs Jesus also. So rather, we should be laboring for their good, knowing that we were not unlike them, both in deeds and in word. And by that, I mean, let us, one, look for opportunities to help them where we can, even earthly good, okay, in whatever form that takes. And number two, give them the good news that they need to hear, knowing that the first without the second won't save them, but the second without the first, they won't trust. They're not going to trust your message if you're not pouring into them in their life. We live in a hateful world, right? It's ironic because a lot of it is... Um, disguised as love, right? We call it love. Um, but behind it is hate. And we, when we love the world like this, this is unusual. And it actually points to the fact that um, you're not from around here, are you? Which is exactly what we want them thinking. Amen?
Well, let's move on. It means letting him be the head. It means leaving home for him. It also means lifting him the highest. And we see this in verses 21 and 22. What does it mean to follow Jesus? You let him take the lead. You let him take the reins. It looks like leaving home for him. You swear your allegiance to him and his country. And it means lifting him the highest. We read these words. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. So he's approached by another guy. Jesus is approached by another guy. And uh, this, this is the, 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 pair, the second of the pair with the other guy. Another disciple means him and the scribe from the previous verse. It's, again, not to say that they are part of the 12 disciples. Um, but he also wants to follow Jesus. And at first blush, what he says seems even more commendable. He, address, he addresses him with a better title. He calls him Lord, right? And he seems to have a really good excuse for why he, he can't follow him right now. He just wants to bury his father before departing with him. Jesus, however, he responds by calling the disciple to follow him instead. And then he says something that if we thought his first statement was on the terse side, this one seems far worse, right? Leave the dead to bury their own dead. It's almost like he's saying, yeah, he's already dead. Let him worry about himself. Or maybe something like, well, now he's a dead man. He's among the dead. Let them take care of their own. (laughs) Or maybe even just let him bury himself. But is that what's going on? No, if you hadn't already noticed, this is another often misunderstood statement, just like the last one. It's true, once again, that this man had some things right. He did call him Lord, a step in the right direction from the last guy. It seems like he has loyalty to his family, a desire to fulfill his own personal obligations, something that we we can all get on board with, right? That's an honorable trait. But there's more going on here than meets the eye. See, asking for leave to go and bury your father in that day and in that culture, that didn't mean that his, de- his dad had actually died, that he needed burying, and that it was this disciple's responsibility to, responsibility to go and do that. No, Jesus would have never had a problem with that. We see all throughout the Bible, especially the Old Testament, burying your family was extremely important. See Genesis 50, verses 5 through 25. See Joshua 24, verse 32. See 1 Samuel 31, 13, to name a few. No, what we read in our English text today is, let me first go and bury my father was an idiom, a figure of speech. Like if I was to say, uh, I just want to have a ball until I kick the bucket. You would know I'm not um, throwing a dance, right? You would know that I'm not going to physically kick a literal bucket. What I'm saying is, I'm going to pursue excitement in my life until I die. Similar, similarly, what we read here, let me bury my father is what, it, what, what that meant was something to the effect of, let me stay here until my dad kicks the bucket, serving my family in all the ways I'm supposed to, and then after I get my inheritance from my deceased father, then I'll follow you. That's what this means. I'll follow you after my dad dies, whenever that day should come. And after I get what's mine through my inheritance, that kind of thing. So in that way, this guy's actions are actually even more reprehensible than the last guy. Because the last guy, it would seem, just hadn't counted the cost. Right? Jesus was straightening him out. Hey, this is what following me really looks like. Okay? You, you good being a vagabond for the rest of your days here? You good being hated by other people? Living, you know, in a world that's not your home? But in this case, this guy knowingly chose his family obligations and possibly his birthright even over following Jesus and understanding this man's intent. What Jesus says afterward, it's not so harsh, is it? He basically just turns the man's words around on him. And what he's getting at is that stuff is going to work itself out, right? Your inheritance, all, the, all your cares of this world, they're going to work themselves out. But laying your life down for me, that takes precedent. And we learned about that not long ago, right? Um, uh, not to be anxious about anything. Right? Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Worry about the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. I think it's worth mentioning that Jesus isn't saying here or to any of us, if you don't drop everything you're doing right now and get in this boat, you're not truly my people. He's using this event 
of him and his disciples going across to the other side as an opportunity to talk about the priority of him in your life. He's saying family responsibilities, your inheritance, and by extension, your livelihood, they all should be lower level priorities compared with following me. He should be put first. Now, to illustrate that point, or to illustrate that tension, rather, let me call to, call to mind two things, okay? And they might seem a little odd at first. Number one, the law of robotics. And number two, the law of God, the Ten Commandments. You guys may not know this, but I'm a visual learner. And, uh, and something I'm learning about myself is I'm not always as effective of a communicator as I think I am. And so any edge I can get to get this information to you guys, I'm going to take. And so let's throw up the uh, laws of robotics If you don't know what the laws of robotics are, they were invented by the famous science fiction writer Isaac Asimov, and they have actually been used as foundations for robotics in the years that have followed, as well as AI research. The laws of robotics go as follows. There's actually a fourth one, but we don't need it right now. The first law is a robot may not injure a human being or allow a human to come to harm through inaction. The second law, a robot must obey orders given by humans, except when those orders conflict with the first law. A robot must protect its own existence, the third law states, unless doing so conflicts with the first or second law. Do you hear those those words? Unless it conflicts with the first law or conflicts with the first or second law. Let's go ahead and go to the Ten Commandments here. This is just an excerpt of the Ten Commandments. Jesus will go on to summarize the whole of these Ten Commandments with two phrases. The first four commandments, which are all uh, really God-oriented, are summarized with, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Mark 12, 30. And the second six, six commandments, which are all about loving others, he summarizes as, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Mark 12, 31. And so if we look at this, you shall have no other gods before me. That's our first commandment. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, which is an extension of that first one, really. And then number five, honor your father and mother. It's about the priority of it all. Yes, you honor your father and mother, but what if your parents are telling you to forsake Jesus? That would be an unless it violates the first law of God situation. Unless it conflicts with the first law of God. Does that make sense? It's about the priority of it all. It's not that this guy wanting to serve his family potentially or even inherit something from his father. It's not that those are bad things. Those are just bad things when they make you violate the first law. When they make you turn your back on your Savior. When you say, yeah, I'll follow you, but this is more important to me right now. Now, what could this look like? I could see this playing out a million different ways, so I'm going to limit myself to just a few options. But I think of this one. I'll sin now, and I'll make it up to God later. Or worse, I'll wander now. I'll live a life of sin, and I'll come back to God later. Is there anything in your life that's taking priority over following Jesus? Is it like career time for you? And after that's done with after you retire then you'll make time for the lord after the kids leave the house you're just trying to get it get through the life's just been crazy right now we'll get back to church i think of sports particularly youth sports right it's like um we only have such a window to train up little timmy in uh in in golf and baseball and football whatever and as you know sports are not uh seasonal anymore they're completely year-round and uh, expensive, and if you actually want to compete, you have to be putting all that time in. And can I just say, uh, I love, I love how much parents love the Lord and love their kids, and they want what's best for the kids. Um, it's just that if if this is like, um, I feel like I'm going to butcher this, but they they also have uh, events on Sundays. Okay, a life of faithfulness to the Lord says. I'm not saying you can't ever have a sports game on a Sunday, all right? I'm not here to make people feel guilty. But if you're, yeah, I'm really butchering this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up a story, okay? Vody Bauckham tells it in one of his books, uh, Family Driven Faith. He talks about a, a, a man who came to him, and he's crying, and he's like, I don't know what's wrong with my son. 
We, we raised him as a, as a man of God. He went away to college, and, uh, and then he, he fell into drinking, and he, he got caught using steroids. He had an athletic scholarship. He got kicked off the team. Like, all this stuff is happening. What, where did I go wrong? And Vody starts peeling the layers back, and it turns out, oh, they, they were missing church for months at a time at points because there's year-round. He's been playing baseball since he was six. He's had private lessons since he was nine. He's been on traveling teams since he was 12. They missed a lot of church. And, and he finally gets to this point where he says, you know what the problem is? You've already given him his priorities. His entire world goes around baseball. Why would he go to college and follow the Lord? These things are vapors. Sports, it's going to pass. <laughs> and sports are great. I love sports, okay? I got my teams, right? I root for them when I can. It's not as often as it used to be. But the Lord... To go back to our realities of a leaving La Casa lifestyle, I'm ashamed I even put that in there. We discussed five realities already, okay? And they have to do with your new relationship with the world as a believer. You're following Jesus is how you live in the world as resident aliens, as paroikos, to return to the Greek word. But that list was incomplete. See, all of those other ones flow out of this one. If you want to do those other five well, you need this sixth one. And we'll throw that up on the screens for you. You need to be undeniably his. Undeniably his. It means that he's your top priority. It means when it comes to all those other things, family, career, your children's athletics, whatever it might be, those come after the Lord in priority. And the truth is when they're in that spot after him, you're going to enjoy them far more also. Because they were made to be enjoyed by God. So you glorify God by indulging in those things in, in such a way as to know that they come from the giver of every perfect gift. When they're in that spot after him, they're just better. They're not trying to fill shoes in your mind that they were never designed to fit. You've got a God-shaped slot in your heart. And no other shaped thing is going to fit. It will only lead to disappointment. And if I may offer this one last challenge to tie these last two points together, lifting him to the highest priority in your life and leaving the world behind for him, how are you doing with this as it pertains to the world? How are you doing with lifting him to your highest priority within the world? Like, does the world know where you stand on this? Like, do they, kn do they know not to invite you to certain things because you're not going to be down for it? Because they know that your allegiance is to Jesus. If people aren't uncomfortable talking about their sin in front of you, that's something to consider. If they're not uncomfortable cussing around you or talking about their sexual exploits or whatever, it might be that you're not actually living for his glory to that degree. It might be that you look a lot like the world. Would people be surprised to find out that you're a Christian? And it might be that you are not as unstained as you ought to be either. But what's really cool is that if you're doing this well, if you're undeniably his, having God's glory as your utmost priority, all of those other things pertaining to the world, they're going to they're gonna fall into place. They're going to flow from that. So this is a bit of what it means to follow Jesus. Next time somebody asks, it means letting him be the head. It means leaving home for him. It means lifting him to the highest priority. This is what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in this world as we await his return in this now but not yet kingdom of his. Might we press into this? Might our lives look this way for the sake of his glory and for the sake of our world and our highest good? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again I say, thank you for reminders. Lord, we need this text. We need to constantly reevaluate our lives in light of your word, we need to constantly be checking ourselves and saying, is this what I look like? Do I, is my relationship with the world like this? Or am I acting as if this is my home? Am I building a little K kingdom, lowercase K kingdom here on earth? Like it's, it's never going to pass away. Am I so concerned with my legacy that I'm less concerned with his glory? Lord, change our hearts. I can speak for myself when I say that 
God, there are areas that I need to grow in this. Change my heart. Lord, we want to we wanna know you more. We want to love you more. We want to shine your light to this world more. And we know that if we are just uh, irrefutably yours, then they're going to see that. It's attractional. There's something different about it. Why don't you complain when you're suffering? Why do these circumstances not affect you the same way that they affect me? I would be so bitter. How can you let them treat you that way and not get upset, not act out? Lord, let them see you in us. God, I just pray that they would see you in us. Let us not look like the world, but rather look like you. And in so doing, invite them to then do the same. God, let them see you in us. That's our prayer. We pray it all in in his name.